can give us your background, your name, who you represent, and a little bit about you as a fan. So um, the gentleman in... And the thing is, I know all three of them, so it sounds a bit false to do this, but the, the gentleman in the corner there, what, what, give us your details. Right, so you recognise my voice. I'm Colin Savage. I represent season card holders on the City Matters Committee, so there's 40,000 of those. Obviously, I'm a season card holder myself, have been since the very early 1970s, so I go to pretty well most home games, all home games, and um, as many away games as I can get to. You might also know me through uh, writing for King of the Kipax, and I appear on other podcasts. And the next gentleman is... My name's Andrew Bucknall. I'm the BAME representative for Manchester City. Just to explain what BAME is. Uh, black, Asian, ethnic minorities categories. But I represent all blues. They're all blues to me, no matter what the colour they are. Um, Stretford born blue. Um, Stretford full of City fans in the 70s. I was one of the rare faces on the terraces, one of the rare black faces on the terraces in the 70s and 80s. And I'd like to say, despite recent you know issues... City's always been a welcoming club, no matter what colour you are, always has been, always will be. And the third representative is? I'm Adam Purdue, Um, I'm representing families and young children or young people. Um, I've been going about 45 years, I think, uh, taken as a child by my dad, Um, and I've been taking my daughter for about 10 years. She's 15 now, so she's been lucky enough that she's in a 10-year City career and she's seen Sergio Aguero in every season, Uh, so she doesn't know what it used to be like. (laughs) Obviously, there are a lot of topics here. Before I actually ask you questions, either from me or from people who've contacted us, what are the issues that matter to you the most? What have, you, have been the, the passions that you've had? As you've sat down in that meeting and you've had fellow fans contact you uh, and say, bring this up, ask that, what are the things that you felt most passionate about? What do you feel you've made the most progress on? And what are the things that you've had the most resistance against? If you can define those topics not easy but but that's what I'm throwing out to you uh, for me a big one was always the, was the catering and I do think that we've had a lot of good results on that um, another big one uh, is transport and uh, that's uh, a, t- a tougher one to crack really um, I, I wouldn't say we've really got any tangible benefit on, th- on that yet but that's got to be something we, we look to do over the next year uh, well, for me, it's uh, transport is a big one for me as well. I'm quite keen on that because um, it affects people's match day experience. I represent 40,000 season car holders and they get lots of complaints about the Metrolink, about car parks, about all sorts of stuff. So we are talking to the club, I think, at the next meeting on March the 19th. They have asked to talk about transport. And particularly when the new, uh, this new 20,000-seat arena comes along, uh, the problems are going to be magnified. So there's lots of things that that we can do to uh, try and do to try and make things better for fans on match day. Well, obviously, atmosphere is a big thing, and people used to say about you know queues, you know standard beer prices and stuff. And we have made seen changes there. You know, pies have gone down, beer's gone down, better queuing systems. But the atmosphere, I mean, one of our first meetings. Safe standing always comes up. People say just you know put standing behind the goal, and we were told pretty much from day one. I think one of the first meetings that City were going to look into safe standing, and I've noticed a few other clubs have mentioned it. So that's a must for me because people just want to stand up at games, and that will create a better atmosphere. We always say about the singing sections. There's two different singing sections. Put everyone together because some people want to stand and shout. Other people just want to sit and watch the game. Standing section, you know what you're getting when you go in there. You, you know, you're going into the bear pit, kind of the mosh pit kind of thing. So that will be um, massive. Love that word, massive. That would be great for Man City if we have safe standing behind the goal. I know the club did mention one end of the ground, but it's got a bit of self standing. It's got to be next to the away fans because, you know, you're like almost like that goading and, you know, that creates the atmosphere. So safe standing is a must at City. All right, well, we'll definitely be touching on that. Let's start with uh, with ticketing. Um, obviously, City, at the moment, are banned from Europe for two years. Um, in fact, it gives me the opportunity uh, on that subject of ticketing. Uh, well, let me, let me ask you this, first of all, before I get to specifics. Um, when do City announce their season ticket prices for next season? And uh, I don't think they've been announced yet, have they? And... Have you had any input at all, or as you as a committee talk to them about pricing for next year? 
No, well, no, we haven't. I mean, they won't announce the season ticket prices probably till uh, the end of the season. I suspect. I think it's normally that, before that, though, April, isn't, it? isn't it? Yeah, it used to be. I, I, they seemed to be late last summer. And, and, and there was a lot of speculation. City denied this, but there was a lot of speculation. They were waiting to see how many trophies we won. So, um, so this decision was, by UEFA, if it if it sticks, is going to be quite significant to this as well, isn't it? Well, I mean, potentially, let, because, let, because we don't force, unlike United, we don't force people to go on the uh, cup schemes. So, well, well here's, here's the question, right? But, the person who sent me this question has to remain anonymous. I know. So. I am going to honour that. Probably my brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, two questions. Um, number one, superbia season card holders and seasonal hospitality members both can pay in advance for all games, all competitions. The question is, should these prices be reduced for 2021-22, sorry, 2021 season without the Champions League? And, and before, while you think about that one, the question two was, should City consider reducing all season card prices now? It's going to be even harder to fill the Etihad if we see a player exodus. Well, uh, as regards the first one, yeah, I mean, the I would like to see a more sensible policy to ticket pricing. As I said, that the prices for a, a family of four to attend at City are the most expensive among the top six to watch a top six versus top six game. As regards seasonal hospitality and um, superbia, you, you'd imagine you're getting, well, probably five games less, aren't you? So I would, Im- I would hope that prices would be reduced accordingly. However, having said what I said before, that we could be under some financial pressure, um, there's an obvious excuse for the club to say we, we just cannot reduce prices because we need every penny we can get, which is... Uh, would be unfortunate, of course. So as a representative of season card holders, who obviously this, there's 40,000 of them, will you be campaign- Do will you understand that from the club? Or will you be campaigning saying, listen, if there's not going to be Champions League and if, if some of the best players are going to desert City, which they may or may not, uh, but we won't know that at the point perhaps when these season ticket prices are set, will you be saying to the club understand that you might need more revenue so feel free to put them up or no our fans deserve a bit of a drop if this happens or, or where do you stand on that and how- well, well when the club put season ticket prices up the last couple of seasons we've been against that because the, the price increase has been minimal you know we're, we're talking maybe about less than a million quid in in revenue overall now, revenue yeah on total revenue now it, it's very dangerous to look at things in terms of total revenue mind you I say I've done my finances over the years and I follow City's accounts quite closely. So we made a profit of £10 million uh, this year, but that was basically a loss of £28 million and a transfer profit of £38 million. So operationally, we actually made a nearly £30 million loss. And For me, one of the good things about City Matters, it's not always one of the good things, is you're forced to look at things from every different point of view. So you've got to take the club's point of view into account, and, of course, you taking the supporters. We'd all like cheaper season tickets or cheaper ticket prices. I think, there's a, I don't, I think that's one thing I would get agreement from all 40,000 season card holders. They'd all love to pay less. Uh, but we have to look at the club in terms of the finances. And I say this £28 million operational loss, uh, and it was the same last year. We've also got to think about that. So, so we can think about we've got a £500 million plus revenue, and, and one million is a drop in the ocean, but it's less of a drop in the ocean when you're looking at a loss. Now, we we pull in far less ticket revenue than our nearest competitors, probably Liverpool, similar size stadium, it's not a London club, and they're pulling in over top, just under 80 million, we're pulling in just under 60 million. So there's a big gap for a similar size stadium. I, I don't know why that is. Well, one of the reasons is we've got a lot of cheaper tickets. Uh, another reason is Liverpool have only got 25,000 season tickets, so they're selling match day tickets. They're selling, um, f- get my maths right, about 25,000 match day tickets at probably a premium price because obviously you sell a match day ticket for more than a season car pro rata. So, yeah, we, we'd love lower season ticket prices. We'd love lower ticket prices because it's all, f- for me, 200 quid for a family to, to go and come and watch Arsenal, family of four, two adults or kids, would cost over 200 quid. 
and to me West Ham on a Wednesday night, as it will be this week, presumably. Will, will be something like that, yeah. Um, at Arsenal, it would cost less. Ars- to go to the Emirates, which we always think is an expensive stadium, to watch, us, that, to watch the game against us would have cost less than, than we're charging for our fans to watch Arsenal. At, um, at Liverpool, a family of four could watch the game for under 125 quid for four of them. So this is a, there's no correct answer on this. I wonder whether as the... Can I, can I just give an example there of yeah. the kind of conversation we've had? So over the, over the last 18 months, we've floated the idea a couple of times of maybe uh, what to do about platinum and gold and, and whether or not we would ever think about getting rid of platinum. And the club's response to that is always, well, that's fine. If that's the decision that you think the fans would like to see, then that's something we'd listen to. But you'd also need to come up with a suggestion as to where we would get the missing 650 grand from. So it's not that, it's not that we can't have any influence on the club, but there are, there are parameters there around revenue that the club will need to get that, that pretty much tie your hand. You know, We can't just say, let's cut all the prices because the club won't wear that. So if City do uh, get banned from the Champions League and there is a massive shortfall, as Collins just explained, the club are not, it, very obviously, are not going to reduce prices because they can't afford to do that. I mean, says that sounds well, realistic. Well, yeah. well, the, second, no, it, you know, it, the follow-up question, though, to, to Andrew, as yeah. uh, in terms of atmosphere, is that, uh, and this is a question, not not an answer. It feels to me as if when prices are a little lower, that encourages, and this may be a bit cliched, but more so-called ordinary vociferous fans to be able to come and afford to go to games and create a better atmosphere, and that the higher the pricing structure is the more you're going to get people who are just going to come and sit and be entertainers if they're going to the theatre. So therefore, it feels to me as if prices and atmosphere are related to one another. Uh, on on your committee, is, do you think I'm right or, or say I'm wrong if you want? Well, an example is the Fulham game in the Cup. I sat in my normal seat. I'm not on the Cup scheme, but I went to this game and there were so many people around me that weren't regular season ticket. None of the people I see on the match day you know, league game were there. It was only me and my daughter, everybody else. And was, it was cheaper, you know, so was it yeah, noisier? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it was quite funny to listen to, to be honest, because it, it was all the young ones, it was all the young kids coming with their parents who would probably never been to a game before. And again, to me, it's like, we can get these people into the ground and season ticket holders who, you know, should be there anyway, because, you know, but again, it's like slight tangent pause, a bit annoyed about the... Complaints with forty thousand people in, you know, for the Sunday kickoff at one o'clock that was on BBC. It was just, you know, that was you know a bit out of order. However, it was you know, meant. But um, just different atmosphere. Not a, it. It's hard to say because that game was finished after the sending off, so it was almost like just we're going to win this game. So there wasn't an app. You know, if it had been a different team, it might have been different. But I don't think the atmosphere was any different because of the pricing. I mean, something that. People say about season when the season cards come and the new scarf and the fancy wallets, it's like, get rid of them. Maybe give us a, a free cup game. We can't guarantee we're going to be drawn at home in the cup, but just something that can be used in the future. Jan, you know, we're at home in January for your likes of Fulham. If you can go for free, people probably would go for free because times are hard. People don't seem to understand. The people who, you know, everybody's having to go at City for this, that and the other. But they don't go to games, they don't understand. It took me ages to get from Wally Range to the Etihad on that Sunday for the, the Fulham game because roadworks, all the, you know, I'm not going to be sorry for myself, but, and I live four miles from the ground, it's difficult to get to games, that's not an excuse. Um, and talking about transport as well, a lot of the problems aren't Manchester City's problems, it's Manchester City Council, as Mark Todd was telling us. Uh, Metrolink is franchised out so they're only allowed to run at certain times um, so again atmosphere people leaving early I think it's all connected to getting home because you can't just come out of the ground and jump on the tram even though the tram runs straight into the ground they don't run you know you can be stood there for an hour and so people might leave when the trams are still running that's not an excuse we even talked about you know we talked about loyalty points was, you know i I won't get into the argument of why people leave. I never leave early, you know, but I know a lot of people who genuinely, you know, live quite far away and if they miss their connection, 
they're not getting home that night and they're having to, you know, not getting home is not an option. All right, let me move on to a different area here. Alexander Savage, who contacted me on the Forever Blue Facebook page, wants to talk about this. You mentioned it before, Andrew, the idea of safe standing. Is it a possibility or just being speculated among fans? Now, before you answer it, um, Tottenham, which was the last game actually that City played as we sit here, um, obviously I was in the away end and there was safe standing. I stood up in specially designed seats that had a barrier across the top and in fact the guy that was sat next to me, who you may have seen on the vlog that I do, was actually concerned that if he had to sit down, the barrier would be in the way. As it happened, of course, the way section didn't sit down. Uh, they stood up all the way through. So it wasn't an issue, and it meant you had a effectively a crush barrier to lean on. And one of the positives he felt about this was that if City score a goal, which clearly they didn't in that one, and people started surging and celebrating, that he would be protected from people behind. So it would that that is perhaps what safe standing is. You still get a designated seat, a, a designated standing area, but you have a proper room to stand there and you have a barrier. Now on that basis, Tottenham already have safe standing for their for the away fans in their ground. I've seen at Wolves earlier this season as well, they have a section of that, it seems like the same sort of thing for a section of their home supporters. So this already exists at two Premier League grounds. Why, and has this been discussed, have City not already installed this? Uh, is or, or are a Tottenham and Wolves breaking the law? I mean, what's going on here? What Certainly, the the attitude within the club seems to be very uh, open to having the safe standing. I think basically it's tied in with the idea of a possible redevelopment of the ground at some point. Um, if 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 safe standing was to be to be legalised before any further development of the ground happened, I'm sure that so, it would so you, be put you, in. Yeah, you're using quite rightly. I understand that, Adam. That the word legalised. So how come Tottenham have got it? Uh, uh, I can answer that. There's, I think, a lot of misunderstanding about safe standing. And just to answer this quickly, I don't want to monopolise the, the podcast, but... <laughs> um, there's two different regulations in place. One is that the Taylor report after the Hillsborough disaster mandated all seater stadiums. So that's... You've got to have a seats in... Uh, championship and uh, and at Tottenham there is a seat there you can fold uh, the and seat and that's the seat now it's the local authority or, or the, the ground safety authority I forget what they're called who mandate that you're not allowed to stand so it's not a legal issue it's a local or bylaw so football safety so therefore issue. we can play with the semantics of, of the yep. wording of whether this is safe standing or not but City could certainly install the same type of rail seating or whatever you want to call it that Tottenham have got they could do that now because Tottenham have done it Wolves have done it so could that be something that you would discuss has it been discussed at the, the City Matters Committee and surely the areas in the south stand that you've talked about Andrew which is the corner that uh, as it wraps around and then the bit behind the goal where clearly all the fans stand up and sing anyway that could be done I know it has a cost implication, but in theory, that could be done between home games, couldn't it? Um, yeah, well, when they did discuss it, they actually talked about the other end, the family stand end of beat when we were saying, well, keep it at the south stand, because they did discuss moving the family stand to east stand level three um, and having, you know, redeveloping, you know, north stand, family stand. So that's where they were thinking, we said... You know, South Stand. That to me, it just makes sense to keep it at the South Stand end because the away fans' access is better on Ashton New Road. So just, just do it there. If you do it at the other end, I just think it's going to create problems. If you have standing and say where the family stand is, and then the away fans, you know, they've all we've said, you know, and the club agree that away fans have to be next to the most boisterous of City fans. So I genuinely think that they haven't got a final decision yet of where of where the long term layout of the ground is going to go. I mean, the, and that's the, the reason why they've not. Done I think it. so. Yeah. I mean, the, the the very first presentation we saw about exactly what Andrew's talking about mentioned the idea of redeveloping the North Stand, uh, putting a third tier on, but making the second tier and the third tier a single steep 
COP type tier, and that that w- that would have been an area if that were to take place, that would be the sensible area to put safe standing in. Then, obviously, as Andrew says, that would involve probably relocating the away fans, and then there's the issues, that, the knock on issues of that. So I don't I don't think the club have decided yet what they're going to do, and that, that's that's why there's no no plans to put any rail seats in yet. See, I completely respect Andrew's view and your view, and and lots of other fans who would agree with what you're saying. Um, I would have a slightly different view in that. Um, Personally, it's always concerned me that home supporters and away supporters, the most volatile types of people who generally are the ones who create the atmosphere, actually are right next to each other. And when the derby happened recently where there were things being thrown and, and you know, I've always thought, you know, it's, it's asking for trouble. Sooner or later, these two types of fans, it's, something's going to happen that we, we then go, how did that happen? Well, you put the two most vociferous sets of fans together. So at many away games, and Tottenham would be an example of it. I'm not, I'm not saying Tottenham is, is reputedly one of the noisiest or most boisterous supporters, but they have that big bank at one end of the ground and the City fans are at the other in the corner. So as far away from each other as possible. From what you're saying, that's not what you want. And I, I understand because I've heard lots of City fans say it to me that that's not what they'd want either. But to me, it would make more sense to have the away fans where they are at the Ashton Road end and then have the bank of most vociferous City fans actually at the other end, so that they are further apart, less trouble potentially in the long run, and what's what's wrong with that? But I, I think I'm in a small minority, clearly, Anna, with that view. Yeah, I think there are um, quite a lot of people who like that idea of being next to the away fans. Yeah, no, I and, understand you know, that. I think we've had this conversation. Yeah. You, watch, you watch people and they never watch the game, they're watching the away fan. Because the other side of the argument is if you say move the um, the, 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 the city south stand fans to the north stand, move the family stand, you'd have away fans next to families. And you don't want that either. So you, in some way you've got to keep home fans uh, next to the away fans. Um I don't like the arrangement as it is at the moment, to be honest. I don't like the, the most vociferous section of two sections of fans split up by away fans because actually the acoustics of the stadium make it easier to hear from the other end. I'm in 109 and, and I can barely hear the, the fans on the other side of the south stand. When I'm sat, occasionally I sit in the family stand with my family, my brother has tickets there and my friends. Occasionally I'll use one of their tickets for a European or a cup game. And I can hear the away fans and the city fans of the South Stand far better from the other side of the ground than I can just round the corner. 